Ladies and gentlemen, the sound you hear is a buzz saw ripping through a painting of George Washington chopping down cherry trees. It's time for Professor Buzzkill, busting myths and taking names. Ah, Buzzkillers, all of you know the depth of my love-hate relationship with the internet. On the one hand, I love the internet and the crazy history stories that fly around it via email and blog posts. They provide grist for the Buzzkill Institute mill. And of course, they keep us floated financially as well as emotionally. And I hate the internet. Because despite our heroic efforts, these crazy and wholly misinformed stories still seem to be convincing large sections of humanity. Some of those folks, some of those sections of humanity, some of those people are adults. They actually have driver's licenses, and they may be responsible for the health and education of their children, but it goes on and on. And perhaps the worst thing about the whole internet myth machine is that even when false, and often dangerously false, and even when debunked, these myths live forever in cyberspace, like tribes of Internet ghosts that come out and haunt us. They get revived. And the whole cycle of belief in this garbage and the necessary debunking starts again. And so here I am again, trying to save all of you from going down that spiral into historical misunderstanding. The myth we're destroying in this episode is one of the worst, but also one of the hardiest. It's the Irish slaves myth. It's on the internet everywhere and unfortunately, it seems to be getting more attention and garnering more believers in more countries as time goes by. Essentially, the Irish slaves myth claims that Irish people were enslaved by the British and sent to the Americas, especially the Caribbean, to work on plantations and in other primary resource industries. In these mythological emails and on Facebook, Irish people were enslaved roughly between 1640 and in the late 1860s or 1870s, and in greater numbers than people enslaved from Africa. So the myth goes, and again, so the myth goes, they were treated worse than African slaves. And finally, the stories claim that later generations of Irish Americans and Irish Canadians and Irish and the Irish diaspora or wherever have never whined about their treatment and demanded reparations. They picked themselves up, dusted themselves off after emancipation, rebuilt their lives, and thrived because of their native industriousness and drive. Members of that Irish diaspora have risen in North American culture despite their slave origins. So goes the story. In fact, as the various versions of the Irish slave myth will sometimes tell you, slavery made them stronger as a, quote, race, and they don't complain about it. Now, you may have seen this story in an email or on the internet, you know, the one that comes from your nutty uncle or, or that guy in the office. It's entitled The Irish, The Forgotten White Slaves. Many important, legitimate historians, specialists in Irish history, historians in Ireland, specialists in the colonial Caribbean, specialists in the Atlantic world have spoken out against this myth time and time again. They've published open letters to major publications and websites who were taken in by the story, which include, by the way, the Scientific American website. And by the way, Scientific American quickly revised their story when it's a historical basis was pointed out to them. We've included a copy of that letter in the blog post on our website that accompanies this episode. And I'm particularly grateful, Buzzkillers, for the work of Liam Hogan, Laura McAtackney, and Matthew Riley for their work debunking this myth. Lots of very good, deep historical work based on evidence. But before I scorch this myth, I'd like to play a recording of the first part of the email version in case you haven't heard it or read it before. It's read to us by Linda, one of the voice actors here at the Buzzkill Institute. Now, the first part mainly deals with the numbers of Irish people, quote, enslaved and sent across the Atlantic. Here it is. Irish, the forgotten white slaves. They came as slaves, human cargo transported on British ships bound for the Americas. They were shipped by the hundreds of thousands, 
and included men, women and even the youngest of children. Whenever they rebelled or even disobeyed an order, they were punished in the harshest ways. Slave owners would hang their human property by their hands and set their hands or feet on fire as one form of punishment. Some were burned alive and had their heads placed on pikes in the marketplace as a warning to other captives. We don't really need to go through all the gory details, do we? We know all too well the atrocities of the African slave trade. But are we talking about African slavery? King James VI and Charles I also led a continued effort to enslave the Irish. Britain's Oliver Cromwell furthered this practice of dehumanising one's next-door neighbour. The Irish slave trade began when James VI sold 30,000 Irish prisoners as slaves to the New World. His proclamation of 1625 required Irish political prisoners be sent overseas and sold to English settlers in the West Indies. By the mid-1600s, the Irish were the main slaves sold to Antigua and Montserrat. At that time, 70% of the total population of Montserrat were Irish slaves. Ireland quickly became the biggest source of human livestock for English merchants. The majority of the early slaves to the New World were actually white. From 1641 to 1652, over 500,000 Irish were killed by the English and another 300,000 were sold as slaves. Ireland's population fell from about 1.5 million to 600,000 in one single decade. Families were ripped apart as the British did not allow Irish dads to take their wives and children with them across the Atlantic. This led to a helpless population of homeless women and children. Britain's solution was to auction them off as well. During the 1650s, over 100,000 Irish children between the ages of 10 and 14 were taken from their parents and sold as slaves in the West Indies, Virginia and New England. In this decade, 52,000 Irish, mostly women and children, were sold to Barbados and Virginia. Another 30,000 Irish men and women were also transported and sold to the highest bidder. In 1656, Cromwell ordered that 2,000 Irish children be taken to Jamaica and sold as slaves to English settlers. Okay, we're back. In the first place, Buzzkillers, this email and again all of its social media and self-published book variants provides no evidence for any of these claims, especially the numerically based ones. Uh, so let me do some quick debunking. The James the Sixth they're referring to here was James the Sixth of Scotland, who became James the First of England when he ascended to that throne after the death of Queen Elizabeth I in 1603. So now James the First of England, who by the way was still James the Sixth of Scotland, don't ask died in 1625 without issuing the proclamation that this email claims that he did. Charles I, James's successor, did issue a 1625 proclamation about settling Virginia. But that proclamation didn't sell, quote, sell 30,000 Irish people as slaves to the English settlers in the West Indies, unquote. The proclamation was about setting up the nature of government and the, the way the tobacco economy would work in the, quote, plantation, call that's the colony, of Virginia, unquote. Now, earlier 1625 proclamations by James about the growing and the harvesting and the exporting of tobacco to England, they hadn't worked the way the crown wanted them to, so that's why Charles wrote this other proclamation. But there was nothing about selling or capturing or sending 30,000 Irish people as slaves to the West Indies. Now, there had been earlier proclamations from 1597 under Elizabeth I and 1603 under the new James I about 
banishing, quote, rogues, vagabonds, and idle and dissolute persons, unquote, who'd been convicted as criminals. These laws sent these rogues, vagabonds, and criminals to, quote, newfound land, the West and East Indies, France, Germany, and the Low Countries, end quote. But, as I've said, these laws applied to individuals that Elizabethan and Stuart governments considered criminals and had convicted as criminals. Now, we don't get into the nature of crime in the early modern Britain. I mean, that's, you know, very, very different, but these people had been convicted. But more importantly, for our purposes here, they were English people. They were Scottish people. They were Welsh people. They were Irish people that were convicted as criminals under this law and sent away, banished more or less. There was no law or proclamation that specifically targeted Irish people because they were Irish. And there's certainly no evidence that 30,000 Irish prisoners were sold as slaves at any time. No evidence at all. Now, the next big number of bus killers that they claim in this myth is that, quote, by the mid-1600s, the Irish were the main slaves sold to Antigua and Montserrat in the Caribbean. At that time, I'm still quoting, 70% of the total population of Montserrat were Irish slaves, end quote. Well, not only is this not true, it's simply a case of adding the word slaves to a more or less accurate estimate of how many Irish people lived on Montserrat. Here's how this happened. The original evidence for this was analyzed by Richard Dunn of the University of Pennsylvania. And he wrote that in the late 1600s, I'm not directly quoting here, but almost, in the late 1630s, 69% of Montserrat's population were Irish. Somewhere along the line, one of the promoters of this myth simply added the word slaves to the word Irish at the end of that sentence. So it became 69% of Montserrat's population were Irish slaves. And they rounded the percentage up to 70. Now, in terms of numbers of letters and numbers of numbers of numbers, these are small. These are quick textual changes, but they change the entire meaning of the sentence and of the history involved. If you're talking about Irish people, that's one thing. If you're talking about Irish slaves, by changing the evidence, that's different. The other numerical claims in the myth are just as fantastic buzzkillers. And I mean fantastic as in the product of fantasy. (laughs) I could go through the email or other versions of the myth line by line. And using the evidence-based historical analysis that genuine historians have produced, I could show you that the numbers are just made up but there's only so much time allotted for each each podcast episode by the podcast gods. And there are other fantastical claims in this myth that simply must be exposed. But quickly, stick with the number saying just for a minute. 500,000 Irish people were not killed between 1600 and 1650. The population did not fall in Ireland by nearly two thirds. 300,000 Irish people were not sold to the West Indies between 1641 and 1652. In fact, during the entirety of the 100 years of the 17th century, only 50,000 people migrated from Ireland to the West Indies. So you've got a claim that 300,000 people went between 1641 and 1652, which is only 11 years. But the evidence is that in the 100 years of the 17th century, only 50,000 people went. Again, Please look through what we've put on the Buzzkill bookshelf and you'll see that those numbers in the email and the other versions of this myth are all, as I've said before, just made up. Now, the second part of the myth tries to eliminate the central fact of what happened and tries to change the definition of the roles of the people involved. Again, Linda, one of our Buzzkill voice actors, reads it for us. Many people today will avoid calling the Irish slaves what they truly were, slaves. They'll come up with terms like indentured servants to describe what occurred to the Irish. 
However, in most cases, from the 17th and 18th centuries, Irish slaves were nothing more than human cattle. As an example, the African slave trade was just beginning during the same period. It is well recorded that African slaves, not tainted with the stain of the hated Catholic theology and more expensive to purchase, were often treated far better than their Irish counterparts. The authors of this myth start this section with a shot across the bow of legitimate historians when they say, quote, Many people today will avoid calling the Irish slaves what they truly were, slaves. They'll come up with terms like indentured servants to describe what occurred to the Irish, end quote. Legitimate and responsible historians, quote, come up with terms like indentured servants, end quote, not only because that's the best term to describe what happened to these immigrants, to describe their legal status and to describe what the, you know, the work that they did in the colonies is the term, the legal term that was used at the time. Therefore, we didn't really come up with the term. We call them indentured servants because that's what they were, indentured servants. Many of you may have heard the term indentured servants or indentured servitude, either in history classes or general discussions of history. And by the way, if you're having general discussions about history that include the term indentured servants, that level of historical discussion is quite impressive, you know, if you're sitting around Starbucks with your friends. Or you maybe have found it or heard it in, you know, historically themed television shows, such as the PBS blockbuster Roots from the 1970s. What happened was there weren't enough people in the New World, in the colonies in the New World anyway, to meet labor demands in the 17th century. And at the same time, there were periods of high labor surplus in Europe. So indentured servitude was the way that big agricultural or other business concerns in the New World were able to bring over the workers they needed from Europe. Let's take the Roots example. They're often depicted as, you know, overseers or mid-level workers on plantations, and that's true. Many indentured servants worked in those types of positions, or they worked in and around the plantation house, but others were field hands. What happened was indentured servants signed or agreed to a form of contract in their home country, which said that in return for passage to the Americas and food and housing while they were there, the indentured servant would work for a master, and I don't want to use the term employer in this episode because that's not the right legal term for the time, and it, it doesn't quite work. It really is a kind of a master because of the contract. For a certain number of years, usually anywhere from one to seven, and those that number of years was set out in the contract. In the vast majority of cases, they were not paid a wage for their work during the contracted years. The agreement was that their passage across the Atlantic was more or less half of their payment, and their upkeep while they were in the colonies was the other half. Once the contracted years of work were finished, the indentured servant was released from his or her servitude, released from the contract, I'll tell you more about my obsession with the term contract in a minute, and could seek you know, paid work. Sometimes plantation owners hired back their own former indentured servants as normal workers, especially if they'd shown facility with the work or had developed, you know, you know, expertise and skills, which would have become by that time after their contract years were finished, essential to the plantation's prosperity. Don't get me wrong, buzz killers. Most indentured servants lived and worked a very difficult life, especially in the Caribbean colonies. Conditions were harsh both in terms of weather and in terms of the the expectations of masters. There is no evidence at all that indentured servitude was easy. Although, obviously, the quality of life for indentured servants varied widely. Indentured servants were more or less tied to the contract they had agreed to. And among other things, this contract could be sold to another person. 
The servant would then start working for the other person for the remainder of the contracted time. This usually happened when a plantation owner went broke or was about to go broke. So the owner would then sell his slaves if he had to and would often sell whatever indentured servitude contracts he held. This is why indentured servitude is often described as, quote, unfree labor. Indentured servants were legally required to work off the length of their contracts and were punished by the legal system if they left their master, if they ran away or whatever, before the contracted terms were satisfied. There were, there, was other, there were other types of unfree labor, white unfree labor, that included prisoners of war, political prisoners, and convicted criminals. And these people were u- usually treated worse than indentured servants. Their labor and treatment was more or less the same as the, that of convict laborers in the United States today. In this case, after they landed in the Americas, this is back in colonial times, they were hired out to owners for certain work and for a certain period of time. They were sort of between slaves and indentured servants. Now, at the risk of repeating myself, Buzzkillers, no one is claiming that life as an indentured servant or life as a white person working as an unfree laborer under different terms was easy or pleasant or that it was an entry-level position on the train to American prosperity. It wasn't. It was very, very harsh, usually very harsh. Some indentured servants, again, like I say, particularly those who were talented at organizing and running farms and plantations, or who had worked themselves up to be major overseers, were able to use that experience and get good-paying jobs once their indentured contract was finished. Some of them eventually bought pieces of land and started building their own fortunes. Most indentured servants did not end up like this. Some died laboring in the, in the heat and the humidity of the West Indies. And most took low-paid field hand jobs or other manual labor jobs after their contract was finished. And they lived out their lives as very poor people with little hope of economic advancement. But they were not slaves, and certainly not held in chattel slavery like the slaves brought from Africa during this period. To suggest otherwise, and to try to bolster that suggestion with, frankly, invented facts and invented statistics is a historical. One useful way to understand the difference between white unfree laborers and African chattel slaves is this. I used to try to use this as an example for my students. Indentured servants were more or less owned and controlled by the contract, by their contract that I've been talking about all this time. As I said, the contract could even be sold to another master. Again, I don't like to use the term employer, but if that makes you think of a different situation than a master-slave relationship, that's fine. And because the, the whole relationship was based on a recognized contract, indentured servants were subject to the legal system at the time. If they broke a law, their punishment was through that legal system. Chattel slavery was entirely different, more complete It was not subject to contracts or a legal system. Chattel slaves were the property of their owners to do whatever they wanted with them. Without recourse to a legal system for mistreatment or abuse, a slave couldn't say, it's not in my contract that you do X, Y, or Z. Slave owners could even kill their slaves if they wished without, well, I mean, if they wished, but if they got out of control and when they were punishing them or beating them, without any threat of legal punishment. And further, and perhaps the most significant and most brutal, is that chattel slavery was perpetual through the generations. Any child born to a slave was also a slave from the moment of birth onwards. If slavery hadn't been abolished in North America, people would still be being born in bondage, buzzkillers, and you know, it would be an unbroken lineage of slavery to this day. And it's very clear from the evidence available to us about the attitudes towards slavery and the justification used for its retention, you know, as an institution. In nearly every case since ancient times, slavery has been based on racial or ethnic grounds. In addition to simple hatred, simple economic selfishness, slave-owning groups 
have condoned slavery on the on the basis that their own culture or race was superior to others and usually superior to a specific group that they were enslaving. The, the slave owning culture would have said genetically superior if they'd known about genetics at the time, and that they were justified in enslaving other groups. And perhaps more, most importantly, and often forgotten is that slavery was a benefit for the enslaved group. The idea is that enslaved peoples might, you know, over the centuries, gradually improve because they were exposed to superior peoples. No one thought this about the people who became indentured servants. If they had, they would have gone at great lengths to categorize indentured servants the same as chattel slaves and would have justified it in the same way. But they didn't, because it was fundamentally different. Now let's take a break, and when we get back, I'll briefly bust the final aspect of this myth, forced breeding of Irish slaves with African slave men. Back in a second. The final aspect of the Irish slaves myth that I want to address is the forced breeding of Irish slave women with African slave men. And here's the section of the email version of the, of the myth, read again by Laura, our voice actor. African slaves were very expensive during the late 1600s. 50 pounds sterling. Irish slaves came cheap. No more than 5 pounds sterling. If a planter whipped, branded, or beat an Irish slave to death, it was never a crime. A death was a monetary setback but far cheaper than killing a more expensive African. The English masters quickly began breeding the Irish woman for both their own personal pleasure and for greater profit. Children of slaves were themselves slaves, which increased the size of the master's free workforce. Even if an Irish woman somehow obtained her freedom, her kids would remain slaves of her master. Thus, Irish mothers, even with this newfound emancipation, would seldom abandon their children and would remain in servitude. In time, the English thought of a better way to use these women to increase their market share. The settlers began to breed Irish women and girls, many as young as twelve, with African men, to produce slaves with a distinct complexion. These new mulatto slaves brought a higher price than Irish livestock and, likewise, enabled the settlers to save money rather than purchase new African slaves. This practice of interbreeding Irish females with African men went on for several decades and was so widespread that, in 1681, Legislation was passed forbidding the practice of mating Irish slave women to African slave men for the purpose of producing slaves for sale. In short, it was stopped only because it interfered with the profits of a large slave transport company. Okay, this is a myth within the larger Irish slavery myth. We've established that there's no evidence for Irish white slavery, so it's impossible for white Irish slaves to be forced to breed with black African slaves. But since this false history keeps getting repeated, let's address some of these claims. There's no evidence for forced breeding of white Irish women with African slaves in the Caribbean colonies or anywhere else. Now this, of course, does not mean that interracial relationships or even interracial marriages did not happen. The history of colonial America contains lots of instances of white masters having sexual relations with African slaves, and the evidence of those relations comes not only from legislation attempting to ban it, but also from the obvious fact of mixed-race children on plantations and in the rest of early modern North America. All the evidence about sexual or marital relations between black people and white people shows, in fact, that it was a crime and that any children of such unions would be legally free. Okay, this goes directly against the grain of the argument made in the Irish slaves myth, that Irish, quote, slave women were used to create new slaves. 
when in fact they wouldn't be new slaves. They'd be free children. Now, obviously, cases where white women voluntarily married black slaves are recorded. There are only a handful of them recorded, but in each case, the children of those married were legally free at birth. That's the very opposite of the definition of chattel slavery. Finally, what happened to indentured servitude? It declined greatly from the early 19th century to the early 20th century, but it wasn't banned, actually banned, in the British Empire and in the United States till 1917. Anyway, historians disagree about the reasons for the decline of indentured servitude, but one of the key causes in the continental United States, anyway, was the expansion of slavery. Natural increase, slaves being born to slaves, had become large enough that indentured servants were no longer needed, more or less. Paid labor could take over what they had done, and there were so many slaves, three slaves could do the work of one indentured servant. Even greatly increased cotton production in the early 19th century didn't outstrip the supply of slave labor because the two went hand in hand. There are many other aspects of the Irish slavery myth, including the ways it was invented and has been spread in the 20th and 21st centuries and how it's continuing to grow and how it's now especially used by white supremacist groups in the United States. Perhaps most unfortunate of all, it's now spread to Ireland, where it's become an, an internet meme that's popular with some groups. And there's even now a Scottish version of the white slaves myth, which also needs to be buzzkill. I said just now, perhaps the most unfortunate thing of all is that the myth has spread to Ireland. But of course, by far the most unfortunate thing by far the most detrimental effect the Smith has had has been to negate and attempt to minimize the actual suffering of African slaves and American-born black slaves. Most versions of this myth continually claim that white Irish slaves were greater in number and suffered far more from the brutality of slavery than African slaves. Yet, so the myth goes, the Irish-American descendants of these slaves never complain about their supposed history of slavery and oppression. They never ask for reparations or further consideration of the historical crimes committed against them. In other words, they say, and they say this literally, why should we pay attention to movements like Black Lives Matter when Irish people, quote, had it worse? Throughout this episode, I've talked about the difficulties and the genuinely harsh working conditions and the second-class citizen status that indentured servants endured throughout their servitude. All of those things need to be better known in our culture, but not at the cost of recognizing the truly inhumane nature of chattel slavery. And if the Irish slaves myth promoters put half the energy into considering the entirety of brutality in the history of the Atlantic world, that they put into retailing this myth, we'd have a much better educated populace indeed. And that much better educated populace might, I hope, ask further questions about oppression. Eventually they might ask about slavery and human trafficking in our own 21st century. That's certainly a subject that needs far greater attention than it's getting as well as far greater energy devoted to its abolition. And though I rarely do this, I'd like to make a plug for an organization that's trying to, to write a contemporary as well as an historical evil. Anti-Slavery International is the oldest human rights organization in the world. It was founded in 1839, six years after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire, because anti-slavery protesters and campaigners knew that slavery would continue in other parts of the world, and people would continue to profit off slavery in Europe and in America. Well, not only has it continued, it's prospered. Millions of people in the world today are either enslaved or directly affected by slavery. So, Buzzkillers, please go to antislavery.org 
and do what you can. Donate. Volunteer. Spread the word. After all, what good is knowing more about history if one of history's greatest evils can't be stopped? Talk to you next week.